It wasn't long ago when taking liquid nitrogen and pouring it all over your PC components was one of the coolest things to do in PC gaming. It was popular to seek out the highest end graphics cards like an ROG Strix, a power color red devil. Oh my God, look how big that thing is. Or even an EVGA Kingpin graphics card. May our fallen brother rest in peace. Nowadays, it feels like overclocking kind of just disappeared and no one noticed. When testing graphics cards, we'd usually see reviewers even take into account the overclocked results of that same product, whereas now reviewers barely take into account the differences between different models of the same graphics card. The difference from one partner model to the next is a couple FPS at absolute best. Some of the most recent and exciting news we've seen about overclocking is someone almost got an RTX 4090 to hit four gigahertz, which is very cool, but this year used to be what everybody was talking about. So what has changed about graphics cards that has made it fade away in the past few years? We're gonna get into that. And today I want to truly figure out if overclocking is viable in 2023 and actually visualize the effects of overclocking. Because it's easy to say that overclocking is amazing, but how much FPS do you actually get? To test this, I have four graphics cards here today. You're gonna look at this and you're gonna count three. The other one is in my PC right now. <laughs> I have for you here a high performance graphics card from both AMD and Nvidia. I have a mid-tier RX 6700 non-XT, which isn't really thought to be a good overclocking card, probably because it only has a one eight pin power connector. And then the last one that I have for you here today is obviously an interesting looking card, but this is an RX 5700 XT, which curiously enough, only draws around 200 watts under load. It has two eight pin power connectors, which technically rates this 200 watt card at drawing up to 375 watts. So this waifu graphics card might be an insanely good overclocker. We'll have to see how it goes. Let's start this off with the Radeon RX 6800 XT. I've actually gotten quite a few comments that the 6800 XT is a very good overclocker. I'm excited to put that to the test. In order to overclock these cards for the three AMD ones, I used AMD's built-in adrenaline software. But I was able to achieve an 8% boost to the GPU core clock on the 6800 XT, as well as a 6% boost to the VRAM. In Cyberpunk, this did result in a 5% boost to the frame rate, which in reality looks like going from like 82 FPS to 88. You can feel this. I did test all these graphics cards in four different games, so let's go ahead and move on to our next one. In Resident Evil 4, this is the prioritized graphics preset, which is basically the high preset in this game. We see a 6% boost to the FPS. Obviously, even at stock settings, the 6800 XT is still a very fast card and is destroying this game at, you know, around 112 FPS at this point. It is a nice boost though, but it probably isn't noticeable to have like another five FPS when you're over like 100. So this one's a little up in the air and it doesn't really push the needle. Here in Remnant 2 on the 1440p native settings ultra preset, the 6800 XT is still pumping out about 73 FPS at stock settings. So I was only saying a 3% boost to the performance and I'm still not sure if I'm CPU limited in this game, if I can benchmark this one properly on my Ryzen 5900X system. Regardless, a 3% boost to the performance isn't looking all that good. Our last game here is a Plague Tale Requiem, and we see a nice boost to the FPS, actually pushing us over 100 on the average by overclocking it for a 7% boost. But what I haven't really pointed out yet is the difference in power draw when overclocking the 6800 XT. And through these games, we saw about maybe a 5 to 6% performance increase on average. We also saw about 10 to 11% more power drawing from this card. Percentage wise, it doesn't exactly make sense to overclock it, but you do get more performance. It just isn't all that exciting. But maybe the 6700 will be better though? One thing I was hoping to achieve with the RX 6700 non-XT, since it is a mid-range graphics card, could it be possible that overclocking this one could bring it up to meet the performance of its bigger brother, the 6700 
XT. When overclocking the 6700, I was able to get a 3% gain to the GPU core clock speed and a 5% gain on the VRAM. That doesn't sound like 16%, but we're gonna try it anyways. Let's see it in some games. With the 6700 non XT, I also wanted to see if, say, in Cyberpunk on the high settings 1440p native here, if going overclocked could boost us up to 60 FPS. Unfortunately, we're not really seeing this in this game. And this is probably because this card doesn't have that much overclocking headroom. It only has one 8-pin power connector, which rates it up to 225 watts. But let's move on to Resident Evil 4. By the way, this game is just like really dark for benchmarking. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but I can't do a whole lot about it. Besides that, though, we do get a 6% bump on the overclocked card, which is pretty nice. And in this case, the stock card was drawn close to 160 watts, while the overclocked one was drawn over 170 in this case, but in Remnant 2. The overall power draw was a lot closer, but we also only saw a 4% boost in the FPS, which translates to about 2 or 3 FPS on average. This isn't really going to push the needle for this graphics card, but let's check it out in Plague Tale Requiem. At the beginning of this test, the FPS difference looks really significant, but as the test moves on, it kind of mellows out into just a 4% performance gain, which isn't all that significant. Not as much as you would be hoping for on a mid-range card, trying to extract as much performance out of it as possible, especially if you're being a little cheap or something. Something else I do want to point out though is that difference in power draw, which we talked about earlier, which causes more heat and makes your graphics card's fans spin up more to control that heat. As you can see on the sock one, it's at like 35%, whereas on the overclocked one is over 40. And you can notice a noise difference on that. Although I am happy to say that even though the 6700 only has one eight pin power connector, it did surprisingly well with the overclocking. And this could possibly be just because of the VRAM overclock being 5% faster because we are at 1440p and higher resolutions are more sensitive to memory bandwidth. So speeding it up could just give it 5% performance. I did mention that the power draw can cause higher fan speeds, but it's not all negative. On this 6700, it was quite efficient with the extra power being about 5% faster in games while only drawing 5% more power. So if you are interested in overclocking this card, it's definitely not a bad move. And no, we did not reach 6700 XT performance, but I'm still impressed with this little guy. And with the 6700, a mid-range graphics card doing quite well with the overclock, seeing another mid-range graphics card like the 5700 XT that has two 8-pin power connectors, all that excess power, and the waifu on the back of it, you, you just have to think, well, this is going to do even better, right? When I was overclocking it, I was able to get a substantial 8% boost to the GPU core clock and 9% boost to the VRAM speed. The theoretical 375 watts available to this card is definitely allowing it to push the limits. And push the limits it did. In Cyberpunk on the high settings, it got 7% performance gains which in this case doesn't raise the performance to like 60 FPS or anything, but at FSR quality, it puts the 5700 XT in an even more playable range with the 1% lows almost at 60 FPS. And again in Resident Evil 4 with a 10% boost to the FPS, putting it well above 60. This is actually bringing this card to a more playable range. And this 5700 XT seems to be the only card so far that gets a significant performance gain in Remnant 2. This game just seems to be a beast on the GPUs. And the overclock is pushing us over 50 FPS. Like these are performance games that you will actually notice. What's funny about it is the 5700 XT is the oldest graphics card that we are testing today. So were older cards also better at overclocking? Or is it just the extra power that's available to it? When a Plague Tale Requiem, it is the same story, another 10% gain. Pushing the average to almost 60 FPS again. Significant performance gains, but what I haven't mentioned yet is also significant power draw. Oh baby, from 190 watts to 260? That is something that you can't ignore. That is about 32% more power. And it's starting to make that 10% gains within the games 
not matter as much. And if you dig a little bit deeper into what was actually going on on the 5700 XT, overclocked, the hot spot temperature was at 98 degrees. That is ridiculously hot. And the fans had to ramp up to try and handle this heat. Obviously, they still weren't able to, but the card got louder and more annoying. And particularly with this model, I have a bad motor and it was kind of annoying. <laughs> Like, why does it make that noise? So it seems like you can easily push a card way harder than it's supposed to be. Which really sucks because I'm not sure if the waifu can handle the heat. On that note though, that leads us out of the AMD GPUs and onto the NVIDIA RTX 3080, a high-end NVIDIA graphics card, just like the 6800 XT from AMD. With the 3080, instead of using AMD's adrenaline software, obviously I can't use that, so I used MSI Afterburner instead to overclock my card. I was able to get a 5% boost to the GPU clock speeds and 8% boost to the VRAM clocks, and I did try pushing the VRAM even further because it just seemed like you could boost it so much. I boosted it almost an entire gigahertz. I guess I went a little bit too far and the card was unstable so I had to reel it back in a little bit. And this did lead to some nice gains on the RTX 3080. 7% more in Cyberpunk, pushing from like 80 to like 87, 88 FPS on average. In Resident Evil 4, it was 6% faster, which kind of like how the 6800 XT was. It doesn't make that much of a difference going from like 108 FPS to 115. It's, I guess it's a nice to have. In Remnant 2, it put up 5% faster performance. Again, I don't know if this is CPU limited or not, and this isn't earth shattering performance gains either. I mean, most of the time it's literally just two FPS. In Plague Tale Requiem, it was the same story, a 5% gain. Yes, the FPS is greater difference in this case, going from like 96 to 100, over 100. But here, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It's kind of just like a winning more kind of thing. The reason I've been talking about the RTX 3080 a little bit here is it's very similar to how the 6700 did. It works very well with the power that it's given to it. As you can see from the stock 3080 to the overclocked version, it's only like a 10 watt difference and the 3080 fully takes advantage of this 10 watts. Not to mention because the power is about the same, so were the temperatures and the fan speed. So it kind of makes you think with the 3080 and the 6700 that there is untapped performance that you can get your hands on at basically no extra cost. However, that doesn't mean overclocking is amazing and everybody should do it. Overclocking does take a decent amount of effort and understanding of how GPUs work in order to just get about four more FPS in your games. And not mentioning the increased temperatures on your graphics card, which also results in higher speed fans, which means more noise and annoyingness at your setup. But at the same time, overclocking can lead to system instability. I didn't bring this up a whole lot in the testing, but in quite a few things that I didn't quite catch on camera, sometimes the graphics cards would just crash because they're being pushed too hard and that makes the system unstable in general. Which in turn made me have to go back and mess with the settings again to bring down the clocks a little bit more so that the card is more stable. And on top of that, you don't even get as much performance when you have to dial back settings if it's crashing. With all the hassle of it, it doesn't really feel like to me that overclocking really provides as many benefits as, as the effort you're actually putting in. It really seems like nowadays that GPUs are coming out of the factory with a very nice balance of performance and stability in your system. And there isn't that many reasons to push them beyond that. As well, it seems like GPUs will also boost automatically to try to get as much performance as they possibly can. When I started this video and I was going about how I overclock these graphics cards myself, I was about to ask you guys if you wanted like a video or something of me explaining this a little bit more in depth if you wanted to overclock cards yourself. But by the end of this video, I'm kind of just like, why would I even show you how to overclock your card? Because it doesn't seem like it's all that useful. <laughs> You know what is pretty awesome? Have you guys heard of undervolting? Yeah, I'm always gonna be a proponent of undervolting because I was able to make my RTX 3080 drop from 330 watts at stock settings all the way to 250 watts by undervolting it. And with this huge drop in power draw, it still performed about the same. 
and at the same fan speeds, the 3080 dropped from 66 degrees to 58, as far as I could tell. Like, Jesus, undervolting is just amazing, especially on very high power cards. Undervolting just be very useful to make them run a lot more efficiently, cool, and quiet. Because one of the things I love about having a graphics card that has such a huge cooler on it is actually when the cooler is way overbuilt and the card just barely has to run its fans and it's just whisper quiet all the time. That's one of my favorite things. So instead of showing you guys how to overclock a graphics card, if you're interested in taking an in-depth look at undervolting a graphics card, you know, let me know in the comments and <laughs> drop a sub and a like if you are, are interested in something like that. To be a little serious here at the end, this video has been an insane amount of work I got into this and I didn't think it was going to be that much, but I tried to film as much of the process as I possibly can, as well as logging all this data and organizing it has been pretty crazy. So I hope you enjoyed this and this clears up a lot of misconceptions or just the current state of overclocking in general with graphics cards. I didn't do this with CPUs. Hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.